While the mainstream left is going full retard right in front of our eyes, there are quite a few in the leftist underbelly who do understand that this retardation cannot go on. This particular group is, in turn, divided into two camps, those who understand that the whole edifice of leftist identity politics needs to go away for the most part, and those who think the edifice is good, but the tactics of building it were mostly wrong so far. And the latter group is far more numerous within the reformist left, which is one of the reasons I laugh out loud when naive lefties say they can reform the left. Seriously, chaps, you can't. In this episode, we'll look at the latter group, those who think the edifice is good, but the tactics must change. Let's explore. Hello everyone, and welcome to another installment of Freedom Alternative Research and Analysis. Alright, for the purposes of this video, I will provide two examples of individuals who are apparently in different camps, but in reality they are in the exact same camp. The extreme left, who denies biology, denies reality, is pro-censorship, fundamentally opposed to freedom of conscience and thought, and is generally a scumbag. After the examples, we'll look into counter tactics because this is what we're doing in the current year, developing more and more tactics to go after the left proactively. So, the first example is Robbie Sove from Reason Magazine. Now, Reason Magazine is a Lolbertarian publication. Now, if you don't know what a Lolbertarian is, please watch this video made uh, last April. Robbie is basically a good example of leftist subversion. He uses libertarianism to promote radical anti-science and biology-denying leftist positions, such as the idea that there is more out there than men and women. Let's read a bit from uh, Robbie's analysis on political correctness and how was that relevant to Trump's election. Quote, Trump has done to America what Yiannopoulos did to campus. This is a view Yiannopoulos shares. When I spoke to him uh, with him about Trump's success uh, months ago, he told me nobody votes for Trump or likes Trump on the basis of policy positions. This is a misunderstanding of what the Trump phenomenon is. He described Trump as an icon of irreverent resistance to political correctness. Correctly, I might add. What is political correctness? It's notoriously hard to define. I recently appeared on a panel with CNN's Sally Cohn, uh, who described political correctness as being polite and having good manners. Now that's fine, it can mean different things to different people. I like manners, I like being polite. That's not what I'm talking about. The segment of the electorate who flocked to Trump because he positioned himself as an icon of irre irreverent resistance to political correctness think it means this, smug, entitled, elitist, privileged leftists jumping down the throats of ordinary folks who aren't up to date on the latest requirements of progressive society. Example, a lot of people think there are only two genders, boy and girl. Maybe they're wrong, maybe they should change that view, maybe it's insensitive to the trans community, maybe it even flies in the face of modern social psychology, but people think it. Political correctness is the social force that holds them in contempt for that or punishes them outright. If you're a leftist reading this, you probably think that's stupid. You probably can't understand why someone would go so bent out of shape about being told their words are hurtful. You probably think it's not a big deal and that these people need to get over themselves. Who's the delicate snowflake now, huh? You're probably thinking. I'm telling you, your failure to acknowledge this miscalculation and adjust your approach has delivered the country to Trump. There is a related problem, the boy who cried wolf situation. I was happy to see a few liberals, like Bill Maher, owning up to it. 
Maher admitted during a recent show that he was wrong to treat George Bush, Mitt Romney and John McCain like they were apocalyptic threats to the nation. It robbed him of the ability to treat Trump more seriously. The left said McCain was a racist supported by racists. It said Romney was a racist supported by racists. But when an actually racist Republican came along and racists cheered him, it had lost its ability to credibly make that accusation. This is akin to the political correctness run amok problem. Both are examples of the left's horrible overreach during the Obama years. The leftist drive to enforce a progressive social vision was relentless, relentless and it happened too fast. I don't say this because I'm opposed to that vision. Like most members of the under 30 crowd, I have no problem with gender neutral pronouns. I say this because it inspired the backlash that gave us Trump. So, what we have here is a hardline leftist who seriously believes in the uh, Orwellian stance that we should call men she if they so choose, and that, that generally the subversion of language through disdainful nonsense like Z or they as singular is perfectly fine. Now, if you don't know what subversion I'm referring to, please do watch this October 2015 video that I made called Z and the subversion of language. He also believes, or at least seems to believe, that Trump is a racist. <laughs> Yet for some reason, we're supposed to believe this guy is a libertarian, and the law libertarian publication Reason actually believes so. But then again, Reason has been a tool of subversion for quite some time now, so it's not particularly shocking. The purpose of this particular example, of Robbie's example, is twofold. One is to serve as a comparison to a much more honest leftist, which I'll provide in a minute, and second, to show how deep-seated this insanity actually is. As I was saying in other videos, while the overwhelming majority of the population, regardless of how they vote, fundamentally disagrees with progressivism and regards it uh, largely as a mental disorder, or at the very least as something wacky and weird, the exact opposite true is uh, the exact opposite is true among the chattering class. Most of the chattering class, including many of those allegedly on the right and allegedly in the non-mainstream media, such as Reason Magazine or even National Review for that matter, still do believe in several the disdainful leftist myths. And leftists know that, but most of the rest of us don't. At least not yet, anyway. Now... The reason leftists are afraid is that they also know that some of their allies are jumping ship and they know that one's worst enemy is one who used to be one of yours. David Horowitz, for instance, is one of the best critics of leftism precisely because he was one of them. On top of this, the insanity of leftist policies has been exposed to the general public much faster than it should have been. The point of progressivism is to contain insanity until it reaches a point when nobody can object to it, preferably when nobody even has the mental tools to even begin to conceptualize an objection to it. And this is where the second example comes into place, coming from a Daily Extra, written by Amy Fox, how to really push back against conservative martyrs like that U of T prof. Now, before reading the article, I will dare to assume that somewhere between 0 and 0.5% 0 of the people who will end up watching this video even heard about this publication. So, in the interest of uh, knowing thy enemy, Daily Extra is a far-left LGBT publication based in Canada and part of the Pink Triangle Press, which is basically the gay Canadian version of Common Purpose in Britain. It's a highly secretive organization aimed at cultural subversion. If you're wondering where the LGBTists are getting their cues from, you should take a look into the Pink Triangle Press. So. Amy Fox uh, says we need a new game plan to preempt people like Jordan Peterson. And please listen to this carefully, because what I'm about to read to you is uh, how the deep left genuinely thinks. So, quote, 
It's been nearly four months since Professor Jordan Peterson made headlines with his public declaration that he would refuse to compromise his grammatical principles by referring to individual trans students as they when requested. Prior to this, the University of Toronto prof made a career in studying the psychological effects of living under historical dictatorship that w then went on to counsel professionals stressed out by politically charged workplace codes of conduct. Out of this, he presumably came to equate refuting university pronoun etiquette with fighting Big Brother. Seeing an influential academic make a media event out of being rude to non-binary and trans students queers pushed back hard. The result? Well, after a media tour, Peterson is supplementing his very much uninterrupted teaching income with a well-crowdfunded series of YouTube lectures that look like a, a curmudgeonly uncle got his hands on a degree and a copy of PowerPoint. Our pushback became his publicity. This is a familiar pattern. Cultural conservatives build a hill to die on and meet left-wing resistance. They do the rounds in print, TV and funded websites to ironically claim that they're being silenced. They get famous, make bank, push their agenda or even get elected. Jordan Peterson, Sweet Cakes Bakery, President Trump. While it's absurd that our opponents now include rich and famous martyrs who make disagreement for discrimination, these people make a cultural impact. So we need a new game plan. Our old tools aren't just ineffective, but often counterproductive. All right. So, so far we have a diagnosis of the problem from the leftist perspective, and it's a remarkably good one for a leftist, that is. Of course, the author ignores the actual violence committed by leftists on events held by what she calls cultural conservatives, such as the Maoist student unions across Canada blocking entries to lectures by Warren Farrell or by uh, our good friend Janice Fiamengo, whose lectures are routinely disrupted, mostly violently, by far-left students at the behest of the leftist deep state within universities. That will be most of the professors. But aside from, uh, besides from that, the diagnosis placed by Amy Fox is not that far off the mark. She understands that the leftist antics are making them unpopular, which obviously pisses the hell out of her. The good news is that her diagnosis is incomplete. That is to say, she lies when she says that, quote, our opponents mistake disagreement for discrimination. Now, I don't know whether she knowingly lies or is simply too far gone to even realize how wrong she is. But nevertheless, the assertion is a provable falsehood. No conservative conflates disagreement with discrimination. Heck, conservatives aren't even particularly worried about discrimination the way leftists are. Most conservatives would be perfectly fine with left-wing discrimination if there hadn't been laws preventing us from doing the same. But regardless of these aspects, based on this diagnosis, this leftist comes up with new tactics for leftists to use. And please listen to this carefully because this is what you'll face individually within the next few years, likely sooner uh, than that if you live in Canada. So, quote, Where did we go wrong? Is this blowback for asking uh, for too much too fast? Well, for our opponents, any small improvement within their lifetime is too much too fast. So no, toning it down is a non-starter. Are we too out? Too loud? Some among the older generation still long for decades when Jane Average didn't grasp that queers existed next door, let alone uh, voted uh, for whichever bigot shouted the loudest about protecting her daughters from our equality. I'd rebut this politic funded on silence among the passable few, but there's no debate to be had. This genie is out of the closet. So how do we stay out and proud and kibush professional bigots? Trying to shame them or shut them down can stroke their martyr complexes and flesh out their fans and their funds. Simply debating them only entrenches their views. Here's a preemptive uh, admission of being wrong. Uh, what we can do is preemptively steal their fans. This sounds cool, but it's hard. This time we are the ones that need to change. 
I'm not going to preach that all of us left-wingers just need to patiently listen to any old Trump campaigner. Asking folks to indulge someone who's midway to stripping you and yours of uh, civil rights and full lifespans is an absurd request. But between those of us under the rainbow who live relatively safe lives and our queer allies, we can poach the other side's ambivalent fringe. Watch some Megyn Kelly, learn the worldview, and go talk politics, or rather, listen politics. Let them do most of the talking while getting a feel for what's actually scaring them. Once you've empathized, slip in one or two ideas for them to chew on, like an anecdote about how a friend is afraid of physical violence if he goes back to his hometown or uses a public washroom. Do this right, come back in six months and they'll often be spouting your idea to their friends. And you may be spouting some of their ideas to yours. Don't worry, it makes you a better person. It's easy to, to inflame rage against a distant and unmet other, right, left or center. But if those of us who can do so safely can foster a sense of compassion and kinship with our opponents' audiences, we will make and become allies where we never expected, and then we can all push back together. Translation. This is a playbook to convert new people to the religion of progressivism using subversion and agitprop by stealth. Nothing's new, really. It's just that for many years, they didn't actually need this. But now they do. So now is there... Um, now, I guess the question is, is there a conceptual difference between this one, this particular individual, Amy Fox, and Robbie from Reason magazine? The answer is none whatsoever. They both believe in the exact same insanity. They both believe that men going into women's bathrooms is perfectly fine and in fact should be legally protected by state violence. They both believe that censoring and or forcing people to believe counterfactual nonsense, such as Caitlyn Jenner is a woman, is more than desirable, and they both believe that such things are achievable, provided that you apply better care in how you fool people into playing ball with such radical degeneracy. The difference between these two individuals does indeed lie in tactics. Robbie is busy subverting the poor souls who still read reason, whilst Amy Fox is busy creating new subverters. And this is the point where I'll probably lose some friends. Well, maybe not. This is the point when I say that these tactics do have a chance of succeeding if we don't start learning agitprop and taking it seriously. Well, that and the fact that we need to start playing with all hands on deck and be willing to use the entirety of the arsenal. Because so far, the left used everything it had and then some, whilst conservatives have sort of responded-ish. When was the last time someone got brigaded and fired for purveying hard-left bigotry? It's hard to remember, isn't it? Meanwhile, scores of people have had their lives ruined for a mild joke. I mean, just remember Tim Hunt, for instance, and other petty offenses that in a sane world would just simply go unnoticed. That is what I'm talking about. One of the reasons this has been going on for so long is because conservatives go out of their way to avoid being mean. Partly because conservatives aren't mean, by and large. Well, what I'm saying is, screw that. For instance, let's take this example from the latter article, quote, Slip in one or two ideas for them to chew on, like an anecdote about how a friend is afraid of physical violence if he goes back to his hometown or uses a public washroom, close quote. The appropriate response to such a tactic is not, Oh, that sounds bad. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> The appropriate response uh, to this is, that's absolute nonsense, and that is an utter lie. You know it, I know it, everyone else knows it. Get your head out of your ass. Or you can try the more empathetic version. Well, you can tell your friend to get his head checked up. Paranoid schizophrenia is serious business. Unless your friend lives in Saudi Arabia, his fears are only the result of an imbalanced mind, likely a mental disorder. The onus is on him to treat that, not on everyone else to pander to his disorder. Now, such responses come off as mean. But they also do a critical job, especially if done in public. They provide the very real and very necessary perspective of 
tough shit. The tough shit perspective used to be transmitted by simply living back. Uh, by simply living. And this used to happen back in prehistory. That was it. That would be like 20 years ago, 15 years ago. When you would learn right from your childhood that, well, life is tough. Basically, to such appeals to emotion, the best response is the adult response, which is swift dismissal of uh, fake outrage and fake concern, doubled by a recommendation to grow the hell up. Now, on to the other advice offered by this individual, uh, quote, Watch some Megyn Kelly, learn the worldview and go talk politics, or rather, listen politics. Let them do most of the talking whilst getting a feel for what's actually scaring them. Now, <laughs> I gotta tell you that when I first read this, I just simply started rubbing my hands and said, Yes, yes, uh, don't you want to read some Thomas Sowell to go along with that Megyn Kelly? <laughs> the thing here is to use their tactic against them. And it is easier for us to do this than it is for them to do it on us. Left-wing academic Jordan, uh, sorry, Jonathan Hyde uh, um, documented exhaustively that conservatives understand liberals much better than the other way around, which kind of makes intuitive sense when you think about it. I mean, for all the belly-aching cries of the cathedral media about bubbles of fake news, the reality is exactly the opposite of what they say. Even if we wanted to, we would have a very, very hard time locking ourselves in an ideological bubble. I mean, it is possible, but it is remarkably hard and not exactly worth the effort anyway. The reverse, however, is not true. A lefty doesn't need to make a conscious effort to lock himself out from non-lefty points of view. Because leftism already is everywhere, and therefore all the lefty has to do is dismiss the occasional conservative here and there as a weird anomaly. And that's pretty much it. Bubble achieved. However, this can be used against them should they decide to actually apply this tactic of listening to the politics uh, in order to find out what scares us. <laughs> Now, I can't stop laughing because by all relevant metrics, including in studies made by leftists, mind you, conservatives simply do live better. We have better sex lives, better levels of contentment, better marriages, more tranquility, and we're generally not that easy to scare. So the implication that one is conservative because one is scared is ludicrous per se, but never mind that. We can use this perception to undermine the leftist tactic, because in the process of trying to find out what's scaring us, they would have to listen quite a lot. Now this does depend on the individual, but by and large there's nothing a lefty despises more than being called uneducated and then swiftly be proven that in front of his peers. And that's not hard to do. Your average university graduate, even those in political science, never read Bastiat, Mises, Thomas Sowell, Friedman, Hayek, the Federalist Papers, and so on and so forth. And even if they did, they didn't understand them. So all you have to do to catch them in the offside, as we say in football, is to swiftly remind them that there is an entire world out there that exists and flourishes outside the tiny liberal bubbles of college campuses and the chattering class. This works particularly well with young lefties. Youngsters in general, and young lefties in particular, do like to think of themselves as highly enlightened and know-it-all. So even if they don't like it, they will take it seriously when it's proven to them that no, they don't know it all. They won't do that though on the spot, but give it several months. Basically what I'm saying here is pretty simple. Use their tactic against them. They, won't want, uh, uh, they want to listen to lear uh, and learn uh, what scares you? Well, give them a pile of books and invite them to a conversation about those books after they've read them. If they don't want to do that, then refuse further conversation and make it no. Something like this. Well, then I refuse to discuss with uneducated buffoons who profess to preach me about tolerance and em empathy, yet have no clue whatsoever about what I think, and even more so, refuse to even get a clue. This kind of rhetoric doesn't work on hyper-partisans, but it does work on the deluded progressive who think he's doing the right thing by applying Amy Fox's tactics. 
All right, that's I, I think that's enough for now. I'll be kind of flooding the channel these days with these long videos because it's the best period when I can do this. Soon enough, news will start being flooded again and I won't have enough time to do these kinds of videos. I'm also cooking a video on left-wing homophobia. Again, very useful tactics there to wipe the floor with the allegedly pro-gay left. And then early in February, there are also a few videos prepared at the request of you, the patrons of this channel. Also, don't forget, soon enough is coming up the video in which I beg you for shekels for the Georgia and Armenia tour. It's going to be glorious. Anyway, with all of that being said, thank you for watching, thank you for your continuous and generous support, and um, I'll see you around on Freedom Alternative.